Welcome to Great Lakes Baseball and our presentation on preparing for college and playing baseball. College baseball does combine both your education and your baseball experience, which does add to it greatly. Deciding which school to attend can seem daunting, and only you can decide. We'll share some information that will aid you in that process. During this presentation, we're going to explain the different levels of college athletics, give you some overview of relating to guidelines of recruiting and visits and things along that nature. We're going to share some self-evaluation metrics for you to pursue the level that best fits your skills. We'll clarify some characteristics for you that are important and help you set up some decision-making criteria on how to achieve your goals, as well as to help you make a final decision. Understanding the different levels. One thing that find, you'll find pretty interesting is that there's over 1,650 colleges of baseball across five different levels in the college athletic system. Any of them can be appropriate for different people. I, don't, I think many times we get caught up thinking that Division I is the only level that is important. It's important to realize that each person has a fit that mixes with their ability their goals and what they want to achieve out of it. I have many people who've been at each level. You can achieve excellence at any of the levels in college athletics. We'll start off with Division I. It's considered the highest level of college baseball. Each school is given 11.7 full baseball scholarships, but the money can be divided up between up to 27 different students, uh, the smallest scholarship being 0.25. Rosters are limited to a maximum of 35 players, although your playoff and game rosters may be limited. Another point to be aware of is that not all colleges are fully funded, meaning they may not have the full 11.7 scholarships to offer. As we go through these slides, one thing I'd like to point out too is I'm not going to read them verbatim to you. I'll pause sometimes for you to look through them, but as well as we do offer this presentation in in person where we go more in depth in this as well as we do sit down with you and offer guidance and help you figure out through our plan where you may feel and where you may end up being best suited. You can see here the number of hours that they estimate you will have involved in athletics at the Division I level. There is a 20-hour limit that the NCAA imposes, but many other things aren't included in that that will be part of your time commitment. Uh, Division two, Division two is the next level, technically, I suppose. Um, they're limited to nine full scholarships. Again, many of the schools aren't fully funded to have nine full scholarships. They have the ability to split these up in any way they want, so there's no minimum. Again, rosters may not be limited by the NCAA, but colleges may have limits in their conference, there's for sure game, playoff, dugout limits, and sometimes Title IX can affect the number of kids who are able to be on teams based on how many are on men's and women's teams. Again, you can see some information on game limits. Uh, Division one and two are required for you to use the NCAA Clearinghouse for eligibility as a senior in high school. You can see the number of hours for athletics has been reduced a little bit for Division II. Division III is the largest division in the NCAA, most schools, most athletes. Their primary focus is academics. They don't provide athletic scholarships. The NCAA doesn't govern them as far as standard minimums to enter school as well. However, schools have their own qualifications and many are very stringent. NCAA Division III schools have very competitive athletics. There's also a substantial amount of academic aid and grant and aids for those schools. So many times a good student may find out that they get more of their college aid from academics than they do from athletics. Again, another small reduction in the number of hours per week that a Division III athlete is committing to their sports. NCAA Junior College 
is a two-year scholarship, or excuse me, a two-year school. Now, the reality with these is they give you lots of options for improving and playing more as a freshman and a sophomore. In a typical four-year school, of course, you're competing with everybody, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, seniors, and redshirts seniors. So there could be four classes besides yours you're competing with. The nice part about a junior college is opportunities are only split between freshman and sophomore, occasionally a redshirt sophomore. What's nice is they're not limited as much in the amount of practice time, and therefore many junior colleges offer a great opportunity for you to work extremely hard and get better. That's why we say keeping your options open. Uh, junior college has three different levels, Division I, Division II, and Division III. Division I offers full scholarships, up to 24 scholarships. Again, remember, not are all going to be uh, fully funded. Division II offers full tuition, which means no room and board. Uh, Division III doesn't offer scholarships. So you can see they have a very robust fall and spring schedule as far as games. And it does offer players the opportunity for the major league draft in multiple years. Someone might be drafted after their senior year in June from high school. Then if you go to a four-year college, you're, pro you're waiting until um, you're either 21 or after your junior year to be considered eligible for the MLB draft. In the junior college system, you're available, to tra you're available um, for after your first or second year. And many kids who need to improve their GPA might go to a junior college. But now it has become even more possible or more probable that a player might be going there because they weren't recruited by the level of school they thought they could go to. So they went to the junior college route, worked their tail off for two years, and then found themselves at a higher level uh, for their next two or three years. Uh, bottom point there, it does not, if, if money is an issue, junior colleges tend to have either more athletic aid or lower cost structures, as well as the ability to uh, commute many times, they can save money those first two years. NAIA is a separate governing body for athletics in college. Uh, it's not affiliated with the NCAA. They offer 12 baseball scholarships as a limit. Again, remember there can be funding issues, no roster limits, and they have a NAIA Path to Play, which offers showcases for NAIA schools. Um, if you have more questions, let's look into it together. Give us a ring. We can talk about it. We're going to talk about the vocabulary of recruiting. All the terms you'll hear thrown around, sort of to be comfortable with them so that you know what people are actually talking about. Verbal commitments. A verbal commitment is exactly what it sounds like. It is a non-written and it is a non-binding agreement. I put gentleman agreement here, which means that you've given your word that you may be going to a college and the coach has told you what they're going to offer you. We'll give you a half a scholarship. You said, yep, I'm going to commit to your university. Again, as with any gentleman's agreement, be comfortable with who you're agreeing with. Make sure you understand that there is no enforcement of it. The early commitment being a risk-reward scenario is important too. If you commit as a sophomore verbally, and we'll talk about how you can do those things later, but you may find that you change over your next two years and decide that you prefer to go to a different type of college, or finances may change, or your academics may change. Signing dates are when you can officially sign a scholarship for a school. Generally speaking, the first signing date opens up in November of your senior year, at which point you can sign a letter of intent. That letter of intent is a legal contract and should be seriously reviewed before signing. Once you've signed a, that contract, you are bound to go to that school unless the school gives you a release. Now, an important note is in your planning, you can sign a letter of intent to a junior college and a division one or two college and have no penalty. Make sure that's clear. A junior college letter or either a D1 or D2 letter and then you can choose to go to one or the other. Now you would have to follow through on that at one of the two for it to be 
acceptable. Division one and two uh, junior colleges, or division one and two have a baseball calendar they have to follow as far as recruiting. Division three has a less restrictive one. Um, NAI and junior college have, again, less restrictions on recruiting you. We'll put some information up here. I think you can read through it if you have questions. We can talk about when you can take an official visit, what makes it an official visit. And, and I think I'll comment on that and that an official visit is one in which the school gives you, that pays for you to be there. They pay for your lunch. They may pay for you to go to the game. They may pay for you to stay overnight. They can pay for your parents. Um, a player can take um, only one paid visit per school and is only allowed five official visits to Division I schools. Encourage parents to attend these visits. Your child is, you've invested in them greatly to this point, and there's really no reason to back off and say, well, it's their choice. The mistake I made, I would recommend that you do make every effort to attend and ask some questions. Next, we'll talk a little bit about when colleges began recruiting a player. When do they make offers and finalize their rosters? The hope with this is that you can be comfortable saying, here's where I'm at, where should I be at? It, it's a process that, although not, com not super difficult, as you go through it, it can be unsettling not to know if what's going on with you is what other people are in involved with. You can see how different schools start recruiting and when they start really working to get their signing. It usually goes down that Division I recruits first, mainly because it's, again, the most, uh, maybe the most attractive. It's the highest level, so they're recruiting their players. Division II and Division III follow soon after that, and NAI and junior college as well. The signing dates, those change annually, so what I would encourage people is to make sure that you're double-checking these on NCAA websites as you go through. Again, this is set up to give you a general idea of what you should be thinking of in your sophomore year. If you're a very high-level player, big Division I schools are starting to pay attention to you now. Uh, most of them are one full year ahead on their respective recruiting classes. To be getting looks, you're going to have to be a four or five outstanding tool player or potentially one that's amazing, like pitching. Uh, you can't commit until the September of your junior year. However, there are some ways that people do verbally commit before that. And you can see that they're currently, September 1st of your junior year is the first official visit you can have. We'll talk in a couple minutes here about um, how you can early commit, but also the NCAA uh, in April of 2019 is looking to change some rules to make it more difficult for early commitments to take place. Your junior year is really where things heat up. College coaches can officially contact you um, June 15th for Division II and September 1st for your junior year um, for Division I. It's important that you think about emailing coaches, contacting them, sending out videos, keeping them updated on your progress if they know about you. And if there are schools you're interested in, it's a great time to start reaching out Talking with your coaches, they should be helping you at this time as well as helping create avenues for you to be into it. Coaches will invite players to camps and invite their whole staff to review them, as well as people really start to pay attention to your uh, showcase numbers at this time. During your senior year, if you haven't signed or been heavily recruited, even up to the beginning of your senior year, it's not a great time to panic. However, your picture does start to become more clear. The chances of you being overlooked and being a high-level Division I player and not have been recruited at all yet is fairly low. However, understand that many kids blossom late. You have the June draft, which takes out some top-level players, and colleges are going to be looking for players who fill in. It is a game of patience versus risk. 
if the longer you wait, more doors may open, but some will obviously close. The junior college opportunity is a great opportunity for seniors who haven't been recruited to a level they like. It gives them an opportunity to say, I'm going to sign here for two years. I'm going to work my tail off to get better. And then I'm going to be in a situation where I can potentially be re-recruited by high level colleges. It's important to make sure that you're tracking your eligibility so that you are, have the school grades and classes completed so that you're eligible to compete in the fall. The question comes up about early commits. I have a friend who coaches Division I sports and he was talking to me about this and he said, here's the deal. Co coaches can't reach out to you. However, through third party arranged communications, coaches are always allowed to pick up the phone. Now a coach may be out seeing another player and see a younger underclassman. They may reach out through a third party to have that player contact a coach, at which point a coach may be able to offer them a scholarship. That's how players are able to do these commitments for 2021, 2022 players. Some sports are even more years out than that right now. And again, it has a lot of risk in that if the coach leaves, things might change. As well as the fact that coming in April this year of 2019, they're going to be looking at, it looks like they may be changing the rules to limit this early commit uh, epidemic in some ways. So the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. We're setting out to give you a map of this process. Again, dream fiercely. This is your chance to achieve your dream and don't sell yourself short. Hard work, effort, and belief have gotten people places no one ever believed they could. Excellence can be achieved at any level, so don't feel like you have to be a Division I baseball player to be an excellent baseball player. And again, live with no regrets. What we're gonna do in the next few slides is help you identify a custom fit for you. One of the most important things is to identify what is the right level for you. Knowing your athletic performance numbers, knowing your academics, knowing your character, that spells how hard do you like to work, how important are these things to you, and understanding again what are your financial preferences really are some questions that help lay those things out for you. We're going to help you identify some criteria that are important to you. The play on words there is do you go to college to play baseball or are you going to college and play baseball? We'll talk about that. We'll help you pick some questions to help you identify a short list of colleges, research them, as well as making some connections and making some final decisions. This section is maybe one of the most important for you to pay attention to. I'll talk a little bit about the overall. We'll have several slides in here with metrics that evaluate certain things. The three that are probably most important by all coaches besides your grades are going to be 60 yard sprint time, throwing velocity, and exit velo. You'll hear these numbers thrown around and in the next slides we will go through some of those. The slides have a lot of information on them so I'm going to set it up so that you can just pause and read those rather than have me read to you about all of them. One thing that's important to understand is that your performance is going to be used to evaluate by many coaches where they feel you fit. Although they're not 100% exclusive or inclusive, if you're below average on some, you'll have to have a substantial compensating factor like potential growth or size for them to overcome that shortfall. When you're evaluating yourself athletic, it's incredibly important to be objective. That's why it's nice to have a coach help you College coaches are almost always going to ask for a third-party verification, showcase numbers. When they bring you in, they may put you through tests as well. When they're looking online, showcase numbers matter. We're in Minnesota. The PBR showcases are a big number that college coaches refer to. We have a performance matrix on here, again, that'll help you understand what different college levels have as a baseline. And you can use recruitment feedback in some ways that says if you're being recruited by Division I colleges, you probably are in a situation where your numbers are at a point 
We do also feel, though, that every player should take additional steps to get noticed. Baseball recruitment is not like football recruitment. Budgets aren't outrageous where everybody gets noticed. Many times you could be sliding through or not being noticed by a college. So sometimes professional help or working with your coaches certainly makes a big difference. This sheet is designed, I'll pause it out here for a second for you and talk on it. This sheet is designed for you to track your numbers. There's places for you to put your sprint times, some ranges on there, uh, pop time for catchers. I put a showcase area at the top for you to say when was my last showcase, how did I do this, date and times. I also encourage you to track those yourself at the bottom and say, it's important to know if you throw 86 miles an hour once downhill downwind and then you show up at a showcase and throw 74, most coaches aren't going to really care about what your one time number is. They're going to say, you hear people say, where do they sit? And when they say where they sit, they say, hey, you may throw 85, but he sits 82. That's the number they maybe put the most interest in. So tracking this can help you decide also, we'll talk a little bit about doing multiple showcase, when it makes sense for you to do another showcase. Here at the top, you can see Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three spelled out. Pitchers, catchers, middle infielders, corner infielders, and outfields. This gives you some information about height, weight, arm strength, speeds, different things in there. And you can pause and go through this on your own. The next slides also have it broken down by position. Again, I'll slow, let you slow this down. NAI and junior college really don't have as much of a set number because they vary so greatly. High level schools that those could be as good as some of the best division one colleges in the country and the bottom level could be at or below a division three level. This is pitcher metrics. 60 yard sprint, sprint metrics, you can see here, infielders, catchers, and outfielders, it is position specific. If you're going to be a high level division one outfielder, you are going to be expected to be someone who's in that six, seven and under speed. This is your fielder throwing metrics. So you can look at this and see infielders, what the speed is across the infield. Catchers, obviously you're gonna have your pop time as well, but that throwing velo really helps them understand where you're gonna hit the maximum at, and outfielders, again, you can see the velocity there at the bottom. Bat exit velocity metrics at the top and catch your pop time at the bottom. Bat exit velocity really separates players, especially as you go up in the higher levels. That ability to turn that ball around in a hurry is something you see as you go up. If you're not in the 95 plus, you're probably not someone who has a chance at the time to be an MLB prospect. Next we'll talk about education. And one of the things that colleges will quickly identify is your acad academic viability. The mindset is if you struggle in high school, they figure you are not going to survive in the collegiate level. They don't want to tie up a scholarship point, or excuse me, a scholarship spot, or a roster spot for somebody who isn't going to be academically ineligible. High GPAs and that hard work ethic are something that they really value. Babysitting is not something they want to be involved with in college. Division one and two do require you to register and verify your academic eligibility of the courses you've taken in high school to make sure you're eligible. We're in Minnesota. Our high school grad standards do exceed both of those, but it's important that you're aware of those and have registered for those, and you will be given an NCAA ID number. This is a great metric for what coaches say they want. A GPA of 3.0 plus. Some coaches are even higher depending on their schools, and they go through standardized test scores. If you're looking on the Division I, they have a sliding metric. Division I and two have a sliding scale for what qualifies you for schools as well as understanding entrance essays and interviews are something I strongly encourage you to practice with your child. Many times they haven't sat down with anybody in a 
a role of authority and discuss things with them. It might be good to have for them to know questions, what are going to happen during interviews. Those are things we have additional information for you on. As well as paying attention to what extracurricular activities you do. Your references or letters of recommendation are great things to be looking for, as well as volunteering experience in the community. What else do you do besides baseball? Character evaluation, again, are you a grinder? Are you a person that says, this sucks, but I'm going to do it? What's your integrity? Again, coaches are in a situation where they want players they don't have to babysit. Uh, the no BCD I got from an extremely good junior college coach who talks about no bitching or complaining or denying. Don't complain about what's going on. And if you do something wrong, own it and don't deny it. Uh, it sums up as act right. Important to evaluate yourself financially. Obviously going to college, baseball isn't like football where there's an inordinate number of full scholarships that will pay for you to be there. Most players are getting a partial scholarship. Almost every player is. And so therefore you have to make up the rest of that. It's important to understand what the federal application for student aid is, which is the FAFSA, as well as looking for additional scholarships to help increase the number of dollars you have in grant to go to school. There's many academic and civic scholarships. I run an organization. We give away two $500 scholarships. For the last six years, we've only had two applicants each year. Understand how financial aid is going to work for you. Student loans, uh, work study. Are you going to have to have a job in college to pay for it? Um, especially the at some levels, the academic amount of aid makes a $40,000 school a $20,000 school if you're a good student. And that's going to be bigger than almost any baseball scholarship people are going to be offering. When you begin to form your shortlist, you are going to put together a list of criteria that help you understand what's important to you in a college. You are in charge of making this list. But I will bet that as colleges start reaching out to you and recruiting you, they will effectively be putting themselves on the list, or at least the first ones reaching out to you. During this process of evaluation, we'll begin with some basic qualities you desire. We have a form in here for choosing or helping you guide yourself. But as you go through the process, the criteria will change, and that's part of the process. As you can see, this is set up at the top for you to compare four schools with each other. And it's comparing them on six criteria. At the bottom, it's set up to weight the first two qualities to give them a better feel. You can use this over and over and change the schools, change the criteria. It helps you in preliminarily setting up the list as well as making your final decision. It's always important to make sure that you, no matter what your selection says that you do pass the gut check on it and say, are there things that you're not putting into words that matter to you? Some of the questions we're going to go through right away are criteria. One of the first ones we hear about, coaches ask us when we're traveling the country is, will this player consider going this far away from home? And it's a great question to ask, knowing do you prefer to stay closer to home or further away? There are many costs added if you have a long commute to school. If you're 1,500 miles from school, you'll have the logistical and financial questions of getting things back and forth, as well as most parents like to go see their kids play. How important is that? How important is being home for the holidays? And what are your emergency contacts like in those areas? It's important for people to realize that just because a college is close doesn't necessarily make it any better or worse. And attending college that you can commute back to your home offers an enormous amount of support for those kids, whether it's family, friends, or your familiarity with the area. Those are things that really make an, an impact on a child's college career or many child's. How important is playing at right away or playing at a higher level. Again, at the beginning we talked about how Division I, II, III, Junior College, any of those aren't necessarily better or worse.
But many times the question is, if you go to a, a Division I college and you don't play for your first three years, how is that going to sit with you? Might you get less practice repetitions? May you, you might not be on the traveling roster or the playing roster. In redshirting, your attention level may drop depending on if you're not one of the starters, you may have to be a lot more self-motivated for those first year or two to compete for that position and stay fit in. It, it is a different experience for sure versus being a starter or not. This question brings in a lot of things that are, are about your college experience. How much time are you planning on investing in baseball? The higher level you go, the more will be required of you. If you're going to a junior college to play baseball, you may have the most time invested there to get better. Is that consistent with what you want college to feel like? How does a college size for classes, for activities, for, for a variety of offerings at the school affect you as well as the city size? Are you someone who wants to be in a metropolitan area or a smaller, just college town? Those things can affect your future. What kind of opportunities are there for internships or what connections do you make while you're playing there? Your religious affiliation is a huge part to that. Is that an area that you want to have involved in your college? If so, something to be honest with right up front and say, I'm looking for this kind of college. Uh, many of them have commitments that require you to uh, sign agreements that you will act in a certain way in college. In your college experience, what do your social activities look like? Do you want to be part of extra associations, such as a fraternity? Do you want to go on spring break? Are you looking to be involved in many other things? Your athletic schedule will probably take up a large part of that time. How important is education in your decision? Of course, this is a loaded question because everybody says absolutely. But many times there's people who are not sure what they want to be when they go to college. They want a degree, and many times that is uh, affects what you want. Do you know what your degree program is? Do you know what your major or minor is? Again, opportunities as far as internships or going on to an advanced degree at the same college. If you're going to a junior college, how will transferring your credits to a four-year school work? Some two-year schools have direct application of their credits, like I have Iowa has a 2 plus 2 option from their junior colleges to Iowa University. What type of course delivery methods are important to you? Are there online courses? Are there night courses? How many classes are available of each type? And the size of your school may affect that. And how many kids are in each class? Are you working with a professor, a TA? Those things make a difference. Recognizing the difficulty of admittance, again, objectively looking at what we have accomplished so far may give you an idea. Are you ready? If you want to go to an Ivy League school or if you want to go to a large college that has difficult admission standards, are you on those levels to be able to get um, accepted into the colleges? The final two we'll talk about are how important are finances in your decisions. Understand, again, baseball scholarships probably aren't going to pay your way through college. So an expensive college that could offer you some scholarship money may be out of reach, as well as many smaller, in our metro area here in the Twin Cities, many of our Division three colleges have a large price tag, but they have substantial academic aid available, and they do have a four-year graduation guarantee which basically means that you're going to be saving money in the long haul as well as opportunity costs. Finally, are there any friends or familial influences that must be considered? I hate to say it, but a girlfriend. Do you have friends that are going to one college that you really want to be with? Or is there a college that dad and grandpa went to um, that you'd like to be? It's, it's, it's a family college that you're going to go to. Or do you have a brother who might be going to that college? So once you've made your preliminary shortlist, it's important that you dig in and research the college even deeper. Look into all the resources you have. 
don't be afraid to ask anybody to help. Your short list is likely to change as you begin evaluating and researching colleges. You may have additional colleges begin to recruit you and now they add to figuring out, okay, where do they fit in this? Having this process definitely helps you reduce the stress. It's a good rule of thumb that if you're receiving interest from schools at a certain level, it's likely there's others who'd be interested you around the country as well. It's important to research your schools. Understand, is there a degree program you're interested in? Use the internet, your school counselor. It's great to stop. You can have an unofficial visit. Go up to your college and talk to the academic advisor. Meet a professor that might be in your degree area and see what other costs and what academic available what academic aid is available. On unofficial visits, it's really important you might notice that what is the school like? Are you a person who loves festivals? Are you a person who wants a huge homecoming? Is it important that the hockey or football team or basketball team wins and it's giant and it makes the college experience amazing? Also, alumni involvement is a good bellwether for how people like that college. As you begin researching the baseball program, checking out facilities, understanding the culture, if you can figure out what the roster size is and where things might affect you fitting in. It's important to understand the coach's reputation, or reputation, excuse me. One great thing is to ask coaches for straight talk from around the area. Most coaches are gentlemen, so it's hard to get someone to say anything negative but understanding what is their player attrition. If they have a dozen players coming in and 11 are leaving, that might be a red flag. Understanding the, the coach's style, is he a teacher or a manager? Is that important to you? That can be a very large criteria in staying at the college. Understanding what they do for winter travel. If you're a northern school, obviously you can't play baseball in snow. And how do they pay for it? Is there fundraising? What kind of aid is available and are scholarships set up to be a four-year or are they an annual renewed scholarship? Checking out all your resources, again, social media, news articles, are there budget cuts? What's the coach's stability there? Rankings. Don't be afraid to sneak out and watch a baseball game or a practice. Now we'll talk about getting noticed. Parents, this is one of the big questions, is where do you apply your resources? to get the most bang for the buck. First off, we're gonna talk about don't get noticed for these. Looking at recruiting pages for coaches, they will ask for your Twitter, your Instagram, your Facebook. They will try to see if you've done anything or continue to do anything that would exclude you. Again, coaches are looking for reasons to say, this isn't our guy. Your public persona, don't really want to go through public records down there and say we don't want to have a record so make sure you're avoiding those situations there are always people who are looking to bring you down but your public persona really is who you are at the field how do you behave after an error are you hustling are you hustling in practice quite honestly I, as coaches some of them will come out and watch a practice without letting you know they're there they might want to know what kind of player you are how do you treat umpires how do you treat your parents how do you treat teammates and coaches and teachers and administrators? Many coaches who are investing you are going to reach out and ask for feedback from these people. That being a high level person, just assume you're on tryouts every minute until you're at your college and then you continue to be as well. If you're going to be reaching out to colleges, it's important that we do our homework. Sending out mass emails with Dear Coach on them are gonna be just deleted immediately. But if you take some time to get to know the coach and their culture, what they've done, and sending them a, a handwritten note about your interest, that has impact. Understand when they're looking to sign their prospects. If you're after that or before that, you're likely gonna find that you don't get much traction. If you can figure out a way to know their depth chart, know what they might be needed, this can be even sometimes asked, finding out when they might have a prospect camp, and understanding the level you need to be at for them to be attracted to you. 
If you're throwing 78, you need to be at 88. Let's put our energy and effort into that. Also, if you're going to showcases and recruiting events, understand where they put their dollars and time to figure out to look for you. The top talks about if you have a, a Fortnite super sniper at Gmail, you may want to change that up and just have one that represents you, your name, and your graduation class. Again, proofreading and personalizing those emails and contacts makes a big difference to many coaches. Uh, knowing their accomplishments, the coach's accomplishment, maybe where he's been at previously. Understanding that most colleges are going to have an athletic questionnaire you're going to fill out. It's going to require quite a bit of information that you may have to get ahead of time. Even things such as your, where your parents went to college. I strongly encourage you to attend a prospect camp. If it's something you can get to where your numbers show you off, being in front of them for an hour and a half and all their staff gets the chance for them to really notice who you might be. The bottom one, video makes a difference. Now, should you have your own video or professional video services? Some of that varies coach to coach. I've had coaches tell me that an iPhone video sent to them might make a difference, but a professional video many times shows the things that they want to see. As far as showcases, understanding if you're a showcase guy, Again, knowing your numbers before you go may make a huge difference. Whether you're investing time and money in something that matters really is whether you, if your numbers sell you. If you're an 88 guy, showcase might be a good deal. If you're a 68 guy, you might want to work on those numbers and then get to the showcase. Uh, by knowing those metrics we talked about earlier, that'll help you understand those. Again, there's hundreds of showcases out there. Which should you attend? Geographic location makes a difference because coaches are going to be attending those that are easiest for them to attend, as well as understanding what the reputation is with coaches. Many times your club coach or your high school coach can tell you one that they recommend that says this is something where people and coaches are using that. Again, if you ask a coach, a college coach, say what, what information are they looking at, that's one you can make sure it's important to you. Should you keep attending them? Many, many showcases. Again, I'd go back and say geographically located. And as your numbers improve, you may want to take another run at it. If you see your numbers go up four or five miles an hour, now you're in a situation where that showcase might be selling you versus if you're going up a mile an hour or throwing the same numbers, it's probably not that important to have another one. Club teams. Club teams take you to tournaments where there are high target locations. College coaches are going to come out. There might be 25 kids at a tournament that they would be interested in versus a, a non-club environment. What's really important to me, high-level teammates really help you understand what great players look like. That helps push you. And if a recruiter's out at your game watching one of your buddies and you happen to have a great game or you happen to be another player, now all of a sudden you come on the radar. Our club coaches are great advocates for you. Uh, we also help you get comparatively evaluated, which means here's what multiple players who have either made it to college and that's what they look like, or here's what you look like compared to the other players you're competing with. We give you opportunity to improve. Uh, there's lots of places and we have facilities uh, to help increase your tool strength. The three main ones, again, speed, arm strength, exit velo. And they offer the opportunity for more experience with recruitment for you. High school coaches, many high school coaches are great assets. It varies greatly whether they have the relationships and are able to help you. Being involved with a really good team obviously gives you opportunities to be seen. Recruiters will be at things like conference and state championships. The same goes with summer ball. <coughs> Excuse me. An avenue for getting exposure is professional, professional exposure consultants. Now they do have a fee for their services and many variables in their effectiveness. If you're using one that just mass markets you, probably not getting as much bang for your buck. Whereas hiring an individual might make a difference 
with their experience, their connections, and their advocation for you. Fees are obviously related to that. Uh, many times they get you better nationwide exposure. They offer video services and they help you design a custom plan for how you're going to get where you want to go. Once you've identified your finalists, you're going to be doing some deeper digging. A lot of that involves official and unofficial campus visits, spending plenty of time. The time of year should be considered if you're going to an area that you're not as familiar with the climate. Applying to schools early at some levels makes a difference because they'll handing, be handing out financial aid and it helps to be early on that. Getting early acceptance may help you put some more dollars in your pocket. As you're making your final decisions, going back to the decision matrix and putting college one or two or one, two, and three to help you identify which wins on the criteria that are most important to you. And scholarship offers, we'll talk briefly about. It's important to know how the bottom line compares. What is the scholarship of? Is it a full scholarship? Is it a partial scholarship? Is it 25% scholarship? Is it 25% of room, room and board books, tuition, everything? Or is it 25% of tuition? How are those things available? Whether you can negotiate or not really depends on the college. Sometimes asking for something to be changed might be available. Other colleges, there's no room for that. And again, always comparing those net costs make a difference. Understand if you're making a verbal commitment, understand it is a gentleman's agreement. So understand if they can email it to you or if you write it down and say, I know that the coach said X number of dollars. That's a great way to have a net offer for you. When you go to your binding national letter of intent, understand once you've done it, you're locked in. When a coach offers you a scholarship, what is the response time? I think it's fair to ask them. If coaches are putting a lot of pressure on you to say you need to sign by this time or else I'm offering your scholarship some, somewhere else, understand how that affects how you feel about him and is that a, a situation you want to be involved with. In fairness to coaches, they may be recruiting four or five different shortstops for that spot because they know that some of them are going to go elsewhere. So understanding when you need to reply to them by makes a difference. Understanding if you have a spot on the roster or if you're going to be trying out in the fall. If you come in, that's something to ask to be aware of. And again, do you have multiple offers? Being good and honest and fair with your communication without hurting your chances is what we recommend. Be prepared. Some coaches will give you a hard sell and pressure. Others are going to give you lots of time and just say, this is what we're about and here's what we can do. Many will be honest and say, we have two or three people that we're looking at. You're one of them. When we have someone, we'll inform the others that the offer is filled. The final thing we'd say is, once you've reached your decision, enjoy. Get excited about the prospect of your next years. I think many times we second guess ourselves and that causes some stress going into the year rather than saying, no decision will be perfect. There will be adjusting to college in the next years. And actually, we're in the, we offer an opportunity to help you get prepared for that year one. We offer this as a guided preparation session and help you understand some things that you're going to face. Talk about the mental challenges, being homesick, maybe not starting for the first time ever or in many years at least, how different coaching styles are, and having some continuation goals of saying, I had a goal to get to college, what are my next goals? We also talk about a few things on the line of social challenges um, to help keep you safe and protect your reputation, as well as some things that relate to physical challenges such as diet, sleep, and, and obviously academics comes into play. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. If you have questions, come see us. Give us a call. We do this presentation in person and go into some more depth as well as we do individual counseling sessions. Thank you.